Our souls are like the bars of our hostelries, crammed with pseudo-antiques because we find the modern too bleak and hard to live with. If you've ever felt that, then you may have gone on to think that the time must come when the amount of sheer falsehood around becomes too great. Someone chokes on it. He becomes determined to reject all illusions and see whether genuine passion and dignity can be restored to human life today. There has been such a man, Friedrich Nietzsche, the chief prophet of the modern age. Nietzsche first came to this part of the Upper Engadin in Switzerland in July 1881. A frail man of 36 years, he was now committed to the life of a solitary wanderer. He was the first great philosopher after Darwin. Man was now utterly alone in the universe, so Nietzsche would be alone. Carrying with him little else but one large trunk, filled mainly with books and papers, Nietzsche eventually found lodgings in this house in Sils Maria. He came to this room and went straight to bed for three days of migraine and vomiting. Then he cautiously took up the daily routine that Stefan Zweig has described. Carefully the myopic man sits down in the small, narrow, modest, coldly furnished room where innumerable notes, pages, writings and proofs are piled up on the table, but no flower, no decoration. On a tray, innumerable bottles and jars and potions against the migraines, which often render him all but senseless for hours, against his stomach cramps, against the slothful intestines, and above all, the dreadful sedatives against his insomnia, chloral, hydrate and veronal a frightful arsenal of poisons and drugs, yet the only helpers in the empty silence of this strange room. Wrapped in his overcoat and a woolen scarf, his fingers freezing, his double glasses pressed close to the paper, his hurried hand writes for hours, words the dim eyes can hardly decipher. For hours he sits like this and writes until his eyes burn. Nietzsche was the son of a German Lutheran pastor who died tragically mad. Young Friedrich was ambitious from boyhood. He had hopes of becoming an artist. He drew, wrote poetry, composed music. Then he became a scholar. He was a professor of classical philology at Basel University by the age of 24. A good horseman, he did 12 months military service, but was injured in a riding accident. He was eventually compelled to resign from the university through ill health and was awarded a small pension, enough to enable him to take up the life of a freelance writer and philosopher. For some seven years, Nietzsche had been a close disciple of Wagner, until he finally broke away to become Wagner's most vehement critic. The only time his bachelor life was seriously disturbed was by his unsatisfactory relationship with the volatile and difficult Lou Salome. With his friend Paul Ray, he formed an irregular platonic friendship with her. But she whipped them both, as he recognized when he posed this photograph. After losing them, he became lonelier than ever. Nietzsche's philosophy represents a violent break with tradition. Zarathustra, his best-known book, was written to replace the New Testament, its central figure being the ancient Persian prophet Zoroaster, or Zarathustra. Why attempt such a book? Because of the extreme crisis that Nietzsche had described in the parable of the madman. A madman lit a lantern in the morning and ran to the marketplace, crying, I am looking for God. I am looking for God.
Unbelievers standing around laughed at him. Has God got lost? Has he gone away? Is he hiding? Wohin ist Scott? Ich will es euch sagen. Wir haben ihn getötet. Ihr und ich! Wir alle sind seine Mörder! We have killed God. All of us are his murderers. How could we have done it? We have wiped away the horizon and unloosed the earth from the sun. Don't you feel how cold it's getting? Won't we have to light lanterns in the morning? There was a baffled silence, and then the madman smashed the lantern. I've come too soon. It's not time yet. The news of the death of God hasn't got here yet. The light of the stars needs time to reach the earth. Deeds need time before they can be seen and heard. Yet they have done it themselves. This is the great spectacle of a hundred acts that will occupy Europe for the next two centuries. The most terrible, but also the most hopeful of all spectacles. In European thought, God had been the ground of being, of knowledge, of truth, of moral value. For Nietzsche, the loss of faith in God meant that the world and everything that human beings had hitherto lived by was disintegrating. Nietzsche saw himself as the paradoxical prophet of a past event. The greatest event of all had happened about a century before, but people still hadn't heard about it. They couldn't take in the implications of it. It meant the end of metaphysics, the end of belief in any kind of objective order or value in the world that might guide human life and support it and give it meaning. A spectre was haunting Europe, far worse than the one Karl Marx had dreamt of, the spectre of nihilism. My anger broke graves open, moved boundary stones, and rolled old shattered law tables into deep chasms. My mockery blew away moldered words and came like a broom to the cross spiders and as a scouring wind to old sepulchres. I sat rejoicing where old gods lay buried. World blessing world loving for I love even churches and the graves of gods. Nietzsche was temperamentally religious. Nobody has felt the loss of faith more keenly than he. He had to find a new faith, a new way of saying yes to life. For the loss of belief in God meant the loss of belief in progress, even in linear time. Maybe nature moves forever in meaningless, futile circles. If so, then Nietzsche's own life of ceaseless pain would be endlessly repeated. Could he say yes even to that, the eternal recurrence? I was walking that day through the woods beside the Lake of Silver Plana. I stopped beside a mighty pyramidal stone. Then this idea came to me, the idea of eternal recurrence. It was jotted down on a piece of paper with the inscription, 6,000 feet above man and time. As long as his mind lasted, Nietzsche believed that this revelation had been a supreme moment in world history. The idea of eternal recurrence had been the test of whether he was able to say yes to life, and he'd passed it. He puts it like this. Suppose that in your loneliest loneliness, a little gnawing demon creeps into your heart and he says to you, you'll have to live this whole life over again with every pain.
pain and sorrow and joy and thought and sigh. Over and over again, in the endless permutations of the world, the sand glass of existence will be turned over and you with it, you speck of dust. Now how will you reply to that demon? Will you curse him? Or has there been a moment in your life so great that it's redeemed everything else and you answer, you're a god, I never heard anything so divine. If you can say that, then indeed you can say yes to life. You're going to have to live this whole life of yours all over again and again after that with every joy and pain and sigh and thought and sorrow, just as it's been. In the endless permutations of the world, the sand glass of existence will be turned over and over, and you with it, you speck of dust. Now, how do you reply to that demon? <laughs> In Sils Maria today, Christian Dorma, actor and Nietzsche enthusiast, takes small parties of people on what he calls philosophical excursions. This is a Satz, that am Anfang der philosophischen Exkursion gut sitzt, gehen wir. He recites texts from Nietzsche in the landscape in which they were composed. Midday. Moment of the shortest shadow, end of the longest error, zenith of mankind, Zarathustra begins. When Zarathustra arrived at the nearest of the towns lying against the forest, he found in that very place many people assembled in the market square. And Zarathustra spoke thus to the people. Meine Brüder, bleibt der Erde treu. Nicht eure Sünde schreit gen Himmel, eure Genügsamkeit schreit gen Himmel. Der Geiz selbst in eurer Genügsamkeit, in eurer Sünde schreit gen Himmel. I entreat you, my brothers, remain true to the earth and do not believe those who speak to you of superterrestrial hopes. They are mixing poison, whether they know it or not. It was the sick and dying who despised the body and the earth and invented the things of heaven and the redeeming drops of blood. They wanted to escape from their misery and the stars were too far for them. Then they sighed, oh, if only there were heavenly paths by which to creep into another existence and into happiness. Then they contrived for themselves their secret ways and their drafts of blood. It is not your sin, but your moderation that cries to heaven. Your very meanness in sinning cries to heaven. Wo ist der Blitz, der euch mit seiner Zunge lecke? Wo ist der Wahnsinn, mit dem ihr geimpft werden müsstet? Where is the lightning to lick See? you with its tongue? Where is the madness with which you should be cleansed? Behold, I teach you the superman. His is this lightning. He is this madness. Also sprach Zarathustra. the Superman is commonly taken to be a kind of antichrist figure, the opposite of the Christian ideal. But Nietzsche's relation to Christianity is rather ambiguous. He's Christianity's greatest opponent, but if you criticize it as well as that, then you can't help, in spite of yourself, functioning as a reformer. And Nietzsche was like Jesus in that he prophesied a coming catastrophe and said that human beings would have to change, to rise to the challenge of it. He's religious in his passionate belief in the spiritual life, in his belief that you must go through the worst to reach the best, in his belief that there is a breakthrough, a, a kind of salvation to be attained. It's been said that the 20th century was born in this room in the 1880s. After pushing skepticism to its furthest limit, Nietzsche finds a whole series of new ideas coming to birth in him. Everything is necessary, therefore everything is innocent.
Every sort of idealism which is discontented with reality as it is, is exposed as a damaging illusion that makes us hate ourselves and hate life. Instead, Nietzsche offers what he calls the innocence of becoming. When we really know ourselves and our desires, then it's innocent and right that we should choose our own values on the basis of our own desires. We consciously and innocently accept life's own self-affirmation and make it our own. And the very fact that this new life-affirming egoistic ethic is itself only another rationalization makes it playful, irresponsible. As Nietzsche says, this is goodwill to appearance. We learn to dance with the dream and are numbered with the masters of ceremonies of existence. He calls it amor fati, the love of necessity. We accept the world as it is without regrets and without any false moralism. Zarathustra has found no greater power on earth than good and evil. But much that seemed good to one people seemed shame and disgrace to another. A table of values hangs over every people. Behold, it is the voice of its will to power. Du sollst Vater und Mutter ehren. Und bis in die Wurzeln der Seele hinein ihnen zu willen sein to honor father and mother and to do their will even from the roots of the soul. A people hung this table over itself and became mighty and eternal with it. The love that wants to rule and the love that wants to obey created together such tables as these. But can you furnish yourself with your own good and evil? and hang up your own will above yourself as a law? Also, it is terrible to be alone the judge and avenger of one's own law. It is to be like a star thrown forth into empty space and into the icy breath of solitude. Thus spoke Zarathustra. In the past, each people had believed their own morality to be absolute and objective. Priests had backed it with the authority of God, and philosophers had set out to justify it. But Nietzsche says, no, this is a mistake. The first task is to explain morality, because morality is human. It has a history, and that history needs to be told. As for the morality of the future, it'll be autonomous. People are going to have to recognize that they themselves are the only source of the values that they live by, and their ethic will be one of self-realization. Nietzsche feared that the 20th century, the century of industrialism, of nationalism, of mass democracy, would be an age of slave morality. The masses would clamor for anyone to lead them, to give them security, to give them employment and a cause. He says, don't let it happen. And that's why, at the end, Zarathustra urges his disciples to go away. They must follow themselves. They must become what they are. They must learn to go their own way. Allein gehe ich nun, meine Jünger. Und auch ihr geht davon. Und allein. I must go away alone, my disciples. You too, now, go away and be alone. Truly, I advise you, go away from me and guard yourselves against Zarathustra. Better still, be ashamed of him. Perhaps he has deceived you. Oder besser noch, schämt euch seiner. Vielleicht betrug er euch. One repays a teacher badly if one remains only a pupil. Ihr verehrt mich. Aber wie wenn eure Verehrung eines Tages umfällt. Hütet euch, dass euch nicht eine Bildsäule erschlage. You respect me. But how if one day your respect should tumble? Take care that a falling statue doesn't strike you dead. 
You say you believe in Zarathustra. But of what importance is Zarathustra? You are my believers. But of what importance are all believers? Ihr hattet euch noch nicht gesucht, da fandet ihr mich. So tun alle Gläubigen. Darum ist es so wenig mit allem Glauben. You had not yet sought yourselves when you found me. Thus do all believers. Therefore all belief is of so little account. Nun heiße ich euch mich verlieren. Now I bid you lose me and find yourselves. Und euch finden. Also sprach Zarathustra. On the 20th of September, 1888, Nietzsche left Sils Maria for the last time and went south to Italy. He thought all was going well with him. In that year, he wrote six books in which he reached a peak of excess and black literary brilliance. Here in Turin, I exercise a perfect fascination. Everyone glances at me, as if I were a prince. Everything succeeds, although it's not likely that anyone has ever had such great things on his hands. There's a special distinction in the way doors are held open for me, meals set out. His mind was breaking. By December, his features had become uncontrollable and he twitched and grimaced ceaselessly. His handwriting deteriorated. He thought he would soon rule the world. On January the 3rd, Nietzsche looked down from his window and saw a cab driver beating his horse in the piazza below. He rushed downstairs to intervene, but the event triggered his total collapse. Nietzsche never recovered his sanity and was nursed by his mother for the rest of his life. He who had thought that one should die like Socrates, freely, quickly and at the right moment, lingered on for ten wretched years. Some have thought that there may have been a link between his philosophy and his madness. For Nietzsche's Superman has to say yes to meaninglessness, destruction, to chaos and alienation even within the self. To try to say yes to all that, for a person as passionately honest as Nietzsche, was to be forced to the edge of the abyss. Did I not seek where the wind bites keenest? Learn to live where no one lives. In the wilderness, where only the polar bear lives. Unlearn to pray and curse. Unlearn man and God. Become a ghost flitting across the glaciers. The final tragedy that overtook Nietzsche was the cruelest of all. In his madness, his sister took control of his literary affairs. It was she who linked his name with proto-Nazi ideas that he had detested. His reputation has still not fully recovered. 